what is the medical problem? What is health? What is illness? As Peter Allmark makes clear in a chapter in the forthcoming Routledge Handbook of Philosophy and Nursing, these are important questions. The answers we decide upon have real and concrete implications for the treatments and help that are and are not offered to people. Yet, crucially or curiously, different and contradictory answers to these questions can be formulated, and these differences are worth considering. Hello, my name is Martin Lipscomb, and I'm speaking to Peter Allmark, a research associate at the University of Sheffield and a noted Aristotelian scholar. Peter, thank you for joining me. Please, would you outline the argument presented in your excellent chapter? All right. Well, thank you for calling it excellent. Uh, it was um, having reread it. There, there are, as always, there are things I want to change about it. But um, so starting off with with the uh, question uh, of whether it matters in, in the first place, what, how we define health and illness and use terms like uh, uh, ill, disease, sick, just to give a, a, an exa another example. There are lots of health terms around um, and it could be a philosophical task to try and pin them down in some way. Uh, and I'm, I'm leaving that term pinned down uh, deliberately vague but I take it to be a kind of philosophical job, or at least a, a job of kind of conceptual uh, clarification. Um, but that might not matter. Uh, and the reason I, th I, I think it does matter that we do it in, in a, uh, a work in, in philosophy and health and uh, uh, health and, and illness is because it has genuine practical problems. And the, the, I begin the chapter with sort of give some examples of those uh, those problems. Um, I, I give four examples uh, looking at, so there are things like um, whether uh, uh, certain things should be described as illness in the first place or whether they're social problems. So uh, teenage pregnancy is, is an example of something that's treated as a, a health problem, but where it's not uh, obvious what why it's a health problem rather than a, a social issue. Obesity might be another another one. Um, and certainly there, there's been a long running debate in uh, it, regarding to me mental illness, whether it, yeah, particularly from the, the sort of period of the, the one flew over the cuckoo's nest stuff, where uh, the idea that people weren't mad, they just had a different way of being in the world and they were being oppressed by uh the man if you like uh, um and that that was kind of particularly sort of summed up in work by thomas sass but also uh later on well in this country by ian kennedy uh in his kind of uh, book looking at um i can't remember what the name of it was actually but it but looking at the sort of medical terminology it was a series of brief lectures uh which were very controversial at the time uh, because he was saying you know, that, that there's an awful lot of value judgments and social uh, kind of uh, uh, so, sort of um, the use of social power uh, in healthcare, and this was this obviously angered the, the medical community at that time. Uh, so that matters. It, obviously, the other I've given a, a second reason is legal responsibility for action uh, if people. Uh, if there, for example, is no such thing as mental illness, then how do we uh, um, attribute uh, uh, mental health problems as a reason or as a factor in uh, defending someone in court? Um, uh, there's sort of a, a, a reason about sort of measurement and justice if we're talking about inequality of health, uh, and we actually don't have a, a, a sound grounding in what we mean by health, then how can we say that this is some kind of, of problem? So uh, so I think that, that there's a sort of prima facie reason for thinking that, that there is a reason that these uh, um, this might matter. The other, the other reason it might matter is that although um, we use health terms all the time. I mean, I, I should think we use everyone. Most people will use health terms uh, every day. Uh, and we don't have a problem with it. We we usually do it fairly uh, easily and without kind of sort of juddering into a philosophical worry about what we mean by those terms. Um, 
but uh, uh, that in fact, when the, the four areas that I've just talked about, there is controversy. And when we actually try and pin the terms down, we then run into, into problems with it. Um, and the, uh, in the sort of third section of the, of the chapter, I kind of uh, look at attempts to, um, uh, that have been made, accounts of, of, uh, of health. Or I sort of focus really on, on the, what I think is the best kind of type, the pluralist type, uh, and an account by Havacamp. Uh, who basically he uh, uh, gives a, a nice kind of um, set of uh, an analysis of different uh, uh, accounts of, of health terms and breaks them down by features. And it's you know if, if it's your area, it's a good uh, article to read. Uh, but I pick out two. One is the uh, uh, whether an account is naturalist or normative or not. And so. Uh, a naturalist account will be one that says, you know, health and illness are terms that are based in uh, the natural world, in the natural functioning of organisms such as the, uh, the human organism. So if someone is ill, it's because there's something going wrong with their functioning, uh, biological functioning. Uh, and normative ones which say uh, that it's, it's a judgment on the fact uh, on the facts or on the way that people uh, are functioning maybe but but it's the primary thing is is a normative judgment rather than a a, a judgment of whether it's biologically functioning properly uh, and those features are kind of that naturalist normative tends to run along reductionist and holist lines as well so uh, uh, naturalist accounts tend to talk in terms of Things like you know of breaking this, breaking the human body up into systems, and saying which of those systems are uh, functioning well and which are not functioning well. And health is just a healthy being is one where most of this, most of your systems are functioning as they should be. Uh, a holist account would would be sort of much wider than that, uh, and would would look at the sort of whole human organism. Uh, and say that that health can't be just broken down. It's not just the sum of parts, uh, and it's that sort of WHO definition of of health. You know that it's not just the whatever it is. You know, uh, uh, which is you know has been if the WHO definition of an of an orgasm rather than of of, of health uh, as, as as it has been described. But but that's a you know that's a good example of a very of, of a sort of holistic account that we need to take account of people's social positioning uh, of, of of and and it, and that's got a good sort of uh, thought to it. You know, if you think re recently discussions about loneliness um, and whether old people being lonely is is just as bad as uh, smoking <laughs> for their health, that it's loneliness is a health problem, uh, then uh, uh, that sort of, uh, that sort of uh, account, I think, is, is, a, is a, certainly a reasonable one. In fact, what I, I, I probably hold to closer to a normative, well, I don't know if I do hold to a normative account, but I certainly sympathise with the normative account. So I think that pluralist account is, is not bad. Because um, what it's saying is that we use different definitions in different contexts. In some contexts, a, uh, uh, um, health terms are primarily to do with what single biological systems. In other contexts, we're talking about much wider things like like loneliness and how people are functioning socially. Um, and it can be given a bit of, uh, of uh, sort of philosophical uh, heft, I think is the term. But from from uh, the idea of a family resemblance, that you could say that health, uh, health and illness terms are uh, have they don't share any particular essence, but they do have a kind of general resemblance. And we know that it's this thing again. We use the terms all the time. We know how to use them, uh, and they have a kind of general resemblance to each other. And uh, but there's nothing that's shared across all of those terms all of the time. Uh, so I, I quite like that. To a pluralist account, um, but uh, it doesn't do much to if you if you to try and apply that that to the uh, um, practical problems that we began with. It leaves all the work to be done. Uh, it says 
that you know that that we what we actually do is make some kind of judgment about the practical problems but doesn't tell us give us any guidance in in that way and i sort of wondered whether there was more that you could do uh, that would uh, offer some guidance uh, and there at that point i sort of borrowed from john paley who's uh, some of his stuff in in the uh, in in this book in this uh, the encyclopedia uh, or uh, what's what's it called again it's the uh, handbook for philosophy of um, handbook. handbook of philosophy and nursing yeah yeah not an encyclopedia of, no. uh, uh, um, uh, and um the uh, uh, john paley's been doing a lot of work on sort of concept analysis and he's done some uh, some work on in that chapter but also some work in, in a uh, a recent book and it's something he's still sort of uh, on the idea of concept analysis in in nursing which i i read before uh, writing this chapter uh, and i borrowed a couple of things from john paley with a view to trying to do something more with the sort of health and illness term and the two things i borrowed from uh, ordinary language philosophy which is part sometimes attributed or uh put alongside uh, the name of wittgenstein but is more really J.L. Austin uh, and sort of others of that ilk. J.L. Austin, who claims he hadn't read Wittgenstein, <laughs> hadn't drawn on Wittgenstein at all for uh, ordinary language philosophy. Uh, but he, his key point, for, as far as this chapter goes, is, is that you can't ignore the real usage uh, of terms. So you can't sort of uh, drift away from the way people use terms in trying to uh, uh, find the, the philosophical basis um, and uh, that you have to then sort of think of lots of different ways in which people use terms and J, you know, reading a J.L. Austin chapter it's amazing the different sort of things he, he can think of or ways that terms are used but um, as Paley points out that there's now kind of computer aided ways of, of actually seeing how people use terms and these are the sort of corpuses of, of everyday language usage uh, and I uh, already well looked at a couple of those and took the terminology different types of uh, terminology how health disease illness were used in in uh, uh, in kind of everyday language and sort of uh, and put those into a table and uh, uh, try to sort of see what the common commonalities across them were, um, and uh, I mean the sort of surprising result from that for me was that health was the most commonly used to, of those terms by far. Uh, whereas, uh, so the, um, the my thought had been that uh, health health is large in everyday language would be driven largely by its opposite that we talk about health when we're thinking about illness. Uh, but that didn't seem to be the case. But the, the other thing was that how those health terms were often applied quite widely uh, and beyond, uh, certainly beyond human beings and into animals and plants, uh, but also into things like machines. Uh, so you could talk about a healthy uh, um, uh, engine, for example. Uh, and uh, so then sort of moving on to the sort of second way of uh, thing from Paley, the, the idea of the method of cases or conception analysis. And I couldn't remember why it was called the method of cases, apart from that you take cases in which the terms are used and then uh, sort of do your analysis of what the meaning is from those cases. Uh, so um, that's what I did. Uh, wait, so what the different examples you find tell us about those health terms and at that point, I wished I'd been a bit more Aristotelian, but but having chosen John Paley's way, I, I just carried on with John Paley's way. But looking at it again, it looks quite Aristotelian to me, the, the, that sort of methodology. And I, I probably should have just uh, done that, maybe. I don't know. But uh, the the um, uh, what the examples were sort of suggesting, you know, though, was that the, re the reason the, the reason we could well firstly I made a distinction in, in different types of health terms and one, one area of confusion is uh, use the term healthy diet uh, we don't mean that the diet is in good good a good state 
is functioning well, we mean it's good for, usually good for us or good for uh, an animal. Uh, uh, so you have to distinguish between sense one and sense two. And I think most of the interesting philosophical stuff is to do with sense one, which is healthy, a healthy animal, healthy engine, healthy human, um, or ill, diseased, whatever. whatever. Um, so I think it's useful to make, make that distinction in the first place. But then having made that distinction, I suggested that health and illness terms always applied to what are called end, end space systems. So systems like engines that have some kind of, so they're a system being a kind of set of things that work together in some way, perhaps towards some end. Uh, so and that's clearest in the case of artifacts that we've created. Um, that you know, an engine can be healthy. If an engine is healthy, it's able to do the things that the engine should do. Um, with animals and human beings, it was less well. Plants, animals, human human beings. It's less clear that there, there are clearly parts of the system. You know, they're very complicated systems. Um, and within those systems, there are things that have ends, like, you know, the, the eye has the end of helping the organism to see uh, the heart to, uh, for the blood to circulate and so on. So we've got lots of parts of our system that you can talk about as having an end. And we can talk about those as being diseased when they no longer can function to those, uh, towards those ends. Um, whether, uh, I, I guess what some of the, the, the the, the papers implying is that you you can apply ends based systems. In fact, it really uh, ultimately it only makes sense to talk about. Um, well, I'm not, I'm not sure about that, but but I, I would say that that um, that human beings and plants and uh, uh, well, if I take plants as a as a good example. We can talk about healthy plants, and we do talk about healthy plants. Uh, and they, these are plants that are doing what they're supposed to do, which is kind of flourish, uh, seed, pass on their genetic code into the into the next uh, generation. Similarly, with with animals, we might say the same. Uh, with humans, we might say the same. Uh, so uh, we're all flourishing to the extent that we do that. If we want, if we want to think there's there's any more to human life than the sort of Darwinian passing on of genetic code, then we might want to think that that um, human beings have uh, ways of flourishing that are uh, as well as sort of passing on the genetic code, but but living well. Uh, that, in, that may include that, but has other things as well. And then uh, health and disease don't just become part, you know, like I have an unhealthy eye because the eye isn't functioning properly, but I have an unhealthy eye because uh, it's it's inhibiting me from from flourishing. Uh, and when you do that, you can then the, the sort of idea of, of, of things like mental illness start to make sense, that, that there is something that's internal, to the way the organism functions, uh, either a part of it or all of it, that is inhibiting inhibiting flourishing. So that the the idea at the end of, of the paper was was ultimately to present that the the idea that health terms are ultimately system based in ends based uh, ends based system based, uh, and that's how we use health and illness terms in everyday life. Um, so yeah, that's a sort of summary of mo most of the paper. I then to kind of return to some of the puzzles. Okay. And, and, uh... Please, that's really interesting. Thank you. Um, it is an excellent chapter. I'd like to ask you a couple of questions. Um, your work makes use of, as you were, as you were saying, you refer to ordinary language philosophy um, and ordinary language philosophy, or, or mid twentieth century Oxford philosophy, along with uh, natural language um, philosophy and natural language ontology they have been criticized um well everything has but they've been criticized mm -hmm. and for example among other jibes it's noted that uh, uh, first we shouldn't necessarily assume that 
ordinary language use reflects or mirrors anything especially important about reality or the things we're interested in. And um, second, since or insofar as ordinary language philosophy reveals that many, if not um, most of the concepts and words we use have multiple, uh, sometimes incommensurable meanings, or if that's too strong overlapping meanings, what a focus on natural language use can actually tell us uh, is perhaps debatable. Now, given the existence of these and other criticisms, given all that Gellner said, please, would you say a little bit more about ordinary language philosophy? What for you makes this an attractive approach? Uh, I'm, I, uh, it amused me when you said that um, uh, uh, you might have taken a more Aristotelian line. I suspect you'd say that in relation to almost anything. Um, but as we know, <laughs> Others are currently looking into ordinary language philosophy. It might be experiencing something of a, a renaissance, perhaps. Um, it is interesting, but there are criticisms. What would you say? I'd, I'd say what, what if, if you were to take the, the idea that, uh, say, health and illness terms have a family resemblance, and we know how to use them, and we use them every day uh, without, dif without difficulty, um, it's not the case that uh, well if if you were to obviously if you were to, to then say actually what health and illness means is something that's unlike almost all of this usage then that would be uh kind of completely arbitrary and 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 would uh, uh would be kind of bizarre really um so um I suppose that when I when I said earlier that I wish I'd been more Aristotelian, I, I suppose I, I, I was thinking I, I included the Aristotelian uh, in uh, the Aristotelian method is to start with puzzles as I did here, uh, and to then look at uh, at beliefs, the ordinary beliefs about whatever it, the concepts that you're looking at. Um, I don't, and in in doing that, you would you would uh, you you would make judgments. You would discard some usages. So you you before we began the recording, you gave the example of the term "sick," meaning great, you know, terrific. Um, it, we we can use that term when we hear that term used. We know exactly what's being said. Uh, but we know it's a kind of outlier uh, and it's almost being used kind of ironically. Uh, in fact, I presume it sort of began with some irony. Um, and it's, it's again part of this thing. It's not, we know what we're doing <laughs> when, when we use that, we use those terminolo terminology. Um, and I mean, without, without language, there'd be no philosophy and there'd be no philosophical problems. Uh, and language is the or, the way that ordinary people communicate. I don't see really how you can ignore it. And the, the great thing for me that I hadn't come across until I'd read um, uh, um, John Paley's stuff, uh, I had read J. L. Austin years ago um, and, and liked it. I liked the style, but but yeah, bear, bear in mind that this is the ordinary language of academics in Oxford in the 1950s, you know, and some, some of it's going to look pretty bizarre uh, and out language will change. Um, but uh, uh, I, the fact that you could, that there were these corpuses of use that I hadn't come across, I don't know if you'd come across them before, uh, that you can just, they're just freely available on the internet and you can get, you know, thousands of examples, and they're, they're growing presumably all the time, of how language is, is, is used. And that seems to me a great tool for people using ordinary lang language philosophy and possibly a, a, a good reason for its kind of rebirth or its um, renaissance. Um, but bear in mind, I think when you're doing ordinary that kind of ordinary language philosophy, you're doing something that does belong to, uh, or is certainly compatible with Aristotelian method, which is, you know, you, this is the point you start from. Uh, doesn't mean you you finish there. Uh, and certainly when when people use health terms, almost nobody is going to be thinking in terms of end-based systems. But when you analyse it, that's what seems to explain what the way we're using 
those terms in a way that resolves the problem with the puzzles. So yeah, I, I, um, I, I'm not really familiar with Gellner's stuff, okay. so I can't can't pretend to be answer that. Okay, so that's very good answer. Your argument also references, as, again, as you've noted, the anti-psychiatry movement, and, and that makes sense. However, are you a little bit unfair to the thinkers who were involved in that movement? Um, surely the claim that, for example, uh, mental ill health... Um, let me just rephrase that. Surely... Surely the claim that, for example, mental ill health was a myth rests on the realisation that unstated and unrecognised value judgments surround or envelop diagnosis and treatment. And, and well, that, that sort of, that is now widely, broadly conceded. And I think you concede that yourself. Um, so are you a little bit unfair, perhaps, or are you overly critical of the anti-psychiatry movement? Uh, I mean, I don't say much about it, really. Uh, 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 so um, I would I would certainly accept that that power has played a you know a large part in in sort of psychiatry, presumably now and in the past. And, and you would use the examples of Russian dissidents and of uh, even in, even in within my time, I, I knew a. Uh, a woman who, uh, a young woman who'd been put in a in psychiatric hospital for being a lesbian, um, you know, it was it was uh, uh, it's and it's clear, you know, the points made by Kennedy and Sasser are are strong, but you have to remember also that Sasser's arguments in particular, and and he kind of explicitly um, endorsed these. Uh, I'd have to find the references again, but. Um, were uh, were used by sort of libertarians to uh, as part of the kind of uh, saying you know it's not a health problem why it, why on earth should any sort of taxpayers money be used to treat something that isn't an illness in the first place um, so there's there's dangers in the kind of total relativism uh, and that you know that that could apply elsewhere and I, I don't. Sass, I think, did embrace that. I certainly don't think Kennedy <laughs> would, would embrace yeah. that. Um, but that, I think there are there are dangers in in just kind of letting go of the anchor altogether. Um, but I, I I suppose the other thing I would say is that what they, what that also shows is that the, the difference between me and Sass. Of me and SAS, but uh, uh, between between the ends based approach and, and SAS, would is to do with the the account of human flourishing. But for uh, SAS, it's grounded in in the little bit libertarian idea of, of people finding their own way and their own that we you're the best judge of what is the way to live, and mine, which is much more tied to the idea that we are animals, social, rational, social animals. And that does tie us down to certain ways of being that are better than others for, for your know, individual flourishing. And that something like schizophrenia, you know, it really does threaten that. It's not just a different way of being. It's a miserable way of being for most people who, who have it. And that's not just because of social, uh, uh, social impositions and social prejudice. Peter, that was really interesting. Um, thank you for speaking to me. And links to the book in which your chapter uh, appears um, and also Peter's other work will be provided in the notes. Um, Peter, again, thank you. It's an excellent chapter. It's really worth reading. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Right, thank you.